Welcome to Locked Up and On Court. Last time we talked about Louis the Fifteenth. So, when Louis the Fifteenth passed, Louis the Sixteenth took over. The ascension of Louis the Sixteenth really marked the uh, beginning of some kind of a disconnect, at least in people's mind, between the nobility and the royals, and really what was happening. Uh, you know, on the streets with the people in France. What was the catalyst for uh, everything was in the summer of 1789 when uh, bread prices went up the roof. The, uh, you know, French people took it to the streets and started to protest. When Louis XVI uh, heard of this, he asked, is this a revolt? And, you know, the famous answer was, no, sir, it's a revolution. Louis XVI and his wife, Marie-Antoinette, were um, actually apprehended uh, in Champagne as they were trying to, uh, you know, uh, flee the country via the German border. They were arrested and rumor has it that uh, they were served Champagne um, during their last meal before they were sent to be beheaded. The demise of the Ancien Régime and its replacement with the Republic plunged France into uh, 10 years of major political, social, and religious uh, turmoil. It was uh, known as the Reign of Terror. So for about 10 years, uh, France was under a directory that was basically people in power going after anything related to the royals and nobility. Evidently for champagne makers, this was devastating because they were making their money selling their champagne to the royals and the uh, people of influence and uh, attached to uh, uh, nobility. So they had to spend countless nights falsifying bills to erase the names and titles of some of their loyal customers and replace those names with just the title citoyen, citizen, which was or then became the proper form of um, address. If there were any good news for Champenois, it was two things. Number one, the uh, elimination of a very insidious uh, tax system that was uh, uh, taxing their products at an exorbitant um, price. And the second good thing that happened to them, some of the uh, best vineyards that belonged to the clergy, to the church, um, were confiscated and then broken into tiny parcels and sold at a very good price to uh, Vigneron. The fancy and elegant life of the last Bourbon kings evidently put Champagne into the spotlight, but it is really someone else that uh, gave it its international stage. His name, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon was born into a family of winemaking, so he knew uh, a lot about the industry and actually became a massive fan of Champagne. He was born in Corsica and at a very early age was sent to the uh, prestigious Royal uh, Military Academy of Brienne in Champagne. It was at the uh, Royal uh, Military Academy that he met Jean-Rémy Moët. Jean-Rémy Moët was the uh, grandson of Claude Moët. He was helping his father um, sell you know, champagne. And he went to the uh, academy to try to sell his champagnes. There he you know, met Napoleon and this marked the beginning of a very long friendship that actually lasted throughout their lifetime. When jean Remy's father passed in 1792 and jean Remy took over the entire house of Moët, it couldn't have come at a worse time. You had the reign of terror, um, blockades by the British that was preventing any shipment to America, which was a total disaster for Moet because America was its number one customer. And you also had, you know, very poor harvest and vineyards that were left with uh, practically no production. If this was a time and period of uh, difficulties for Jean-Rémy Moet, 
On the other hand, it was a time of great opportunities for Napoleon, who rose to power. He was appointed uh, in 1799, first consul, and five years later declared himself emperor. Napoleon's rise to uh, power really marked the beginning of fantastic times for Champagne. Upon gaining power, he immediately appointed Jean-Antoine Chaptal as his uh, minister of interior. Chaptal was a very famous and smart chemist who had written a bunch of uh, books and uh, treaties on uh, winemaking, the techniques of winemaking as a science, and uh, came up with the concept of adding some little sugar into the bottles before the first fermentation would be effectuated. Um, this is a technique that's called as uh, chaptalisation. Another thing Chaptal did was to ensure that uh, France was completely independent. So in order to stop relying on the sugar that was coming from uh, sugarcane plantations in the Caribbeans, he uh, lobbied to have uh, beets planted throughout France to extract the sugar and use that sugar for the uh, chaptalisation. Napoleon made Chaptal a member of the Légion d'honneur, which he created. Chaptal is also one of the 72 names that are written at the bottom of the Eiffel Tower. Another one who was made a member of the Légion d'honneur was Jean-Rémy Moët. Before each of his uh, military campaign, Napoleon always made sure to stop in Epernay and visit his good old friend Jean-Rémy to uh, get his supply of champagne. From this came his famous quote, where he said, in victory, you deserve it. In defeat, you need it. One time, being in a rush, he failed to make his usual stop in Epernay. He was on his way to Waterloo. When Napoleon abdicated, very soon after, both Epernay and Reims were occupied by the Russians. Tragically, sailors were ransacked and uh, completely destroyed. The worst one was actually Moet. But instead of being devastated, Jean Rémy kept telling himself, qui a bu boira, he who drank will drink. Moet was right. Post-Napoleon's abdication, he single-handedly became the world's most famous champagne maker and was supplying the majority of the courts throughout Europe. But he was not the only one who had kind of an imprint on the international scene with his champagne. Somebody was giving him some pretty tough competition. Her name, Barbe Nicole Ponsardin, also known as Veuf Clicquot. That's it for now. Hope you'll join me next time. Until then, always remember, life without champagne bubbles is flat. So, make it pop. Cheers.